Hello, thank you very much for tuning into this Bible study. Today, we are going to see Paul finally make it to Rome. Today, he had, we, we go through Acts 27 and the beginning of 28. Uh, he starts out uh, his, his journey today in Caesarea, uh, and he's gonna end up today uh, in our talk finally making it to Rome, but it's not gonna be an easy journey. Uh, he gets shipwrecked, and we're gonna see that as we go through Acts 27 today. So why don't you bow your heads, and let's dedicate this time to God. Lord, thank you. Thank you for uh, this time. We dedicate it to you, and I pray that you will open up our minds and our hearts and our ears to that which you would tell us and how you would guide us. We love you, Lord. Please be here with me now and speak through me. We love you, Lord. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so Paul has been talking about making a trip to Rome for a while now. We actually saw in um, Acts 23, 11, um, that specific verse is, uh, Take courage, Jesus says, as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. The Lord told him when he was imprisoned in Jerusalem that he was going to be going to Rome. But that was a confirmation. We saw that earlier when he was uh, on his third missionary journey. He wrote to the Corinthians, but he also wrote to the Romans. He wrote Romans, the letter, the book that we have, Romans. Um, in fact, let's turn there. Romans 1. Uh, let's flip over. Flip open your Bibles to Romans 1. And we're going to go to verse 8. So this is the letter that he writes, Paul writes to the Roman church, to the believers there, while he is still in Corinth is the likely location that uh, he wrote this. Um, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. God whom I serve in my spirit is preaching the gospel of his son, is my witness how consistently I remember you, constantly, excuse me, constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now at last, by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. So Romans is a letter he writes in preparation for him finally making it to Rome, but we're gonna see him make it to Rome today. So Paul has been led by the Spirit. He knows that he wants to continue uh, his missionary journeys, and uh, one location he, he feels led to is Rome. Now, he didn't realize that he was going to go there in chains, but let's flip over. Um, well, you don't, aren't going to flip there, but here's this graphic. We've been using this graphic, and next week we're going to conclude Acts, and we'll go through this graphic again. But I want you to notice where we're, we are right now. Um, in 59 AD, you see this shipwreck voyage to Rome. That's what we're going to cover today. Acts 27, 1 through 28, 16. But before that, you see he has already written, and I want you to keep this in mind, he's already written all of these letters to the various different churches that he started up. In 57, he wrote to Romans uh, from Corinth. In 55, he wrote 2 Corinthians. In 55, he also wrote 1 Corinthians. First from Ephesus, the other one from Macedonia. Uh, he also wrote somewhere in here, he wrote Galatians. Um, he wrote First and Second Thessalonians. So all of these letters have been written before this trip. And today, as cross-references, cross we're actually going to be looking at several verses from Romans. We're also going to be looking at Second Corinthians as evidence, as information. And it's really cool that at this point, we can jump back and forth uh, in time to be able to see his opinions, his thoughts, frozen in time through these letters, the epistles that he's written. And I'm also very excited to be continuing on going into Romans and continuing on through those uh, letters he's going to write because we have the context and the information in Acts that is the foundation for those teachings. Okay, so now let's flip over uh, to Acts 27 and we're going to make some headway. This is a long chunk, and Luke, who is the author, uh, goes to great pains to write a lot of details about this voyage. So I'm going to go through this. It's kind of story time. Sit back, relax. Um, just absorb this and try to picture yourself on this journey uh, with Luke, with Paul, 
uh, with Aristocharis. He's one of the uh, apostles that we know is traveling with them as they go on this journey that takes a really long time. When it was decided that we would stay, sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius, who belonged there uh, to the Imperial Regiment. We boarded a ship from Adramitium, uh, about to sail for ports along the coast of the province of Asia, and we put out to sea. Aristocharis, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was with us. The next day, we landed in Sidon, and Julius, in kindness to Paul, allowed him to go to his friends so they might provide for his needs. From there, we put out to sea again and passed the Lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. When we had sailed across the open sea off the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra in Lycia. There, the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy and put us on board. We made slow headway for many days and had difficulty uh, arriving at Nidus. When the wind did not allow us to hold our course, we sailed to the Lee of Crete, opposite Sa Salmon. We moved along the coast with difficulty and came to a place called Fair Havens near the town of Lycia. Much time had been lost and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the Day of Atonement. So Paul warned them, men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to the ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter and the majority decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This is a harbor in Crete facing both southwest and northwest. When the, the gentle south wind began to blow, they saw their opportunity, so they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind. So we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed the lee of a small island called Keda, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. So the men hoisted it aboard. Then they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. Because they were afraid they would run aground on the sandbars of Sardis, they lowered the sea anchor and let, it sh and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard and with our own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. After they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you have spared yourselves this danger and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar and God has graciously given you the lies of all those who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that I, it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. On the 14th night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea when about midnight, the sailors sensed they were approaching land. They took soundings and found that the water was 120 feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again and found that it was 90 feet deep. Fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors left the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it drift away. Just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. 
You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from your head. After he said this, he took some bread, gave thanks to God in front of them all. Then he broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. Altogether, there were 276 of us on board. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. When day daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. Cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea and at the same time untied the ropes that held the rudders. Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind and made for the beach. But the, the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow struck fast and would not move and the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping. But the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to get on planks on other pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached land safely. We're going to continue on in a minute. What a story. What an amazing story that Luke, the author of Acts, tells us. This is an interesting thing. There's a couple different questions that, that are raised. Why does Luke go into so much detail about this story? It's very, very specific. The four anchors being dropped, the ropes going around the hull of the ship, uh, the number of men that were on the ship, the communication between the uh, captain of the ship as well as the owner of the ship. A lot of detail. Whereas in the past, as we've looked at the, the different missionary journeys, uh, Luke is very quick to say, we went from here and then hit here and then hit here and then hit here. There's also an important thing to notice. I don't know if you caught it, but at the very beginning, when it was decided that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius. We. There's four sections in the book of Acts in which Luke says we as opposed to they. He kind of goes back and forth. And the only way you really notice that, I found, is when you, when you cover a lot of ground in Acts very quickly, you then notice it jump out, the we statements versus the they statements. All that means, in my mind, and in historians' perspective when they look at this, Luke was not present with Paul through every single thing that happens in Acts. And that's okay. That's absolutely okay. So you see times at which, uh, in fact, his first imprisonment, when he's in Caesarea for two years, a lot of scholars believe that it was at that time that Luke comes to Paul and where he writes both his epistle of Luke, but then he also writes Acts. And he gets a lot of the information then. But we know, based on the we statements, that this sailing voyage, Luke is with them. So now let's do a little bit of historical uh, context here. I've got a freaking dog hair hanging off me. So I did some research, went online, and the first thing I found was a neat little excerpt. Um, I did a Google, ship, a Google search for um, Alexa Alexandrian grain, Alexandrian Roman grain ship. Something like that was the search that I, I did. Um, and the first thing that popped up uh, was this um, article that was written by Trinity University, and it's in their digital commons, their archive. And it's all about the ship uh, that Paul uh, was on and the historical background for it. I'm not going to read all of it, but I found it really interesting. Because for, first of all, for me, when I think about um, biblical times, I don't think of a ship that can hold 280 people. That's a big boat. I think about the small little boat, especially when we look at um, the epistles and the story of them crossing the Sea of Galilee and the sea boats that they use to go fishing, the, the boats that they use on the Sea of Galilee, which is a lake. Uh, I mean, they would fit like 20 people in them. And that's what I pictured. And so it's tough for me to picture at the very beginning in, in Acts 50, or excuse me, not Acts, but in 55 AD to 60 AD in that time frame, having a boat that big. And that is one of the things that a lot of skeptics claim is, is that, that 
those big boats didn't exist. Yes, they absolutely did. And we have from external sources information that the Romans did create them. So I'm going to read just a chunk of this. I'm not going to read all the pages of it. But um, in CE, Common Era, uh, BC, or, or excuse me, AD or CE, CE 62, St. Paul left Caesarea for Italy. Sailing in a vessel of unknown type, he reached Myra on the south coast of Turkey, where he boarded another ship for the second leg of his trip. Acts 27, 6 through 28, 16 records subsequent events. The voyage to Crete made difficult by unusual autumn winds, an attempt to find a Cretan harbor in which to stay the winter, and finally the tempest that drove the ship across the Adriatic and caused it to wreck on the island of Malta. This story is more than a tale of adventure. From the perspective of nautical and uh, archaeology, it preserves important information about the type of vessel on which Paul and his companions sailed. A ship en route from Alexandria to Italy, carrying grain as its cargo, and a crew of 276 passengers. That's We get all that from what we just read, Acts 27.6, 27.38, and 27.37. All that information is in there. There is little doubt that the ship in question was one of a very special fleet designed and constructed by the Roman ex Romans expressly to transport grain from the fertile land of the Nile to Italy, particularly to Rome. The article uh, then cites two historical evidences uh, external to the Bible in which they have um, articles that, and, and historical texts that were written about the same time frame in which they talk about these Alexandrian grain ships. Um, and that's all that I'm going to get to in this. But you can go um, and look. There's actually um, photographs that are a part of this um, that show an excavation of a boat about that same time uh, that was shipwrecked in Caesarea, which Caesarea Maritime, um, uh, as we've talked about before, this was King Herod Agrippa, this, uh, King Herod uh, the Great built Caesarea up as this massive port uh, and you can go and you can look. Um, in fact, that's a fun Google search is to look up uh, the ancient port city of Caesarea. And you can see aerial photos um, because the water is so clear. You can actually see the original, um, uh, what's it called, um, that goes around and creates a port um, where they, they, they put all the rocks out there. Um, to be able to create a safe harbor for the boats to be able to come in. And that still exists to this day. You can actually uh, scuba dive and snorkel down and see uh, what remains uh, of what um, King Herod the Great built. It's pretty cool. So that's some information from a historical context of the ship that they were on. Now let's talk a little bit about, oh, and I do have photos. So here is uh, one photo of what uh, some people believe that these grain ships looked like. Um, these are merchant vessels that would have been able to carry all the grain that they were looking to, plus uh, 280 passengers, which is a lot of people to be able to fit on these. Um, but this is what I found as far as um, what they could have potentially looked like. Now let's talk about the, the voyage, that the, the trip, the, where they went. I printed all these out as simply references for myself, and I'm making a mess here. But so this map uh, is out of my Bible. It's in the bottom corner. Um, but you can see from this that they start in Caesarea and you can see them go up uh, to Antioch. And then it says they go in the Lee of Cyprus. And they use the word Lee several times. And all that simply means is it's on the, the safe side uh, of the island where the wind uh, is, they are protected because the island itself is blocking the wind, so they are able to safely um, traverse. Keep in mind, this is not a motorboat. These are sailboats. They are completely dependent upon the winds to be able to um, send them along. Then they go to Crete, and they had planned to winter in Phoenix on the very, very west side of Crete. But that's when um, the winds pick up. And this map is a modern day map. And I thought this was interesting. And this is just a side tangent. While I was prepping for this yesterday, right? Uh, I was prepping for this. Today is actually uh, Tuesday. Jake, what is it? The 28th? Yeah, today's Tuesday the 28th when we're filming this. I know it airs on Wednesday, but I'm filming it on Tuesday. Inner secret, I often film on Tuesday simply so that I have time 
to function life and everything else in my business on Wednesday, even though these air on Wednesday, I need time to edit them. Um, but on Monday, when I was prepping for this, I was going through and I was pulling up all these different maps, an earthquake hit Crete. And as you will see on this map that I'm showing you, um, Google, as I was using the Google Earth Maps, it popped up with a 6.0 earthquake that hit Crete. And I didn't know Google Maps could do this, but it showed in real time when it hit, um, it put a, a notice out and a, a warning out that there'd been an extreme earthquake. We are living in the last days. Whether uh, Christ's second coming is happening uh, in the soonest it could possibly be is seven years in a day, assuming that the rapture happens today. Uh, but it could also be in the next hundred years. But we are very much living in the last days. There's no question of that. As things ramp up, you can see it. It's everywhere. Um, and a, a great talk to listen to is Matthew 24. I, I did two separate talks, 90 minutes each, talking about end times. Because in Matthew 24, Jesus specifically answers the questions that the disciples ask. When will the end of the world be? When will we see uh, the signs of the times that the end is coming? And one of the specific things that Jesus says is that you'll see earthquakes in diverse places. And I thought that was pretty crazy. As I was prepping for today's study, an earthquake happens in Crete, uh, and it pops up while I'm literally looking at it. Okay, so they're making their voyage. I want to make sure I didn't miss anything as we're going through because I'm jumping through. Um, okay, so we have Aristarchus. We've talked about him before. I'm jumping all the way back to the beginning of Acts 27 just to make sure I didn't miss anything as I was uh, jumping along. So Aristarchus, um, we know that he is with Paul uh, as a fellow worker, a fellow servant. He, Paul uses both of those descriptions to describe him. Um, in Colossians 4.10 and Philemon uh, 2.4, both of those are letters that Paul has already written um, or, or that he wrote specifically. He mentions Aristocharis being with him. And we first meet Aristocharis on his third missionary journey in Acts 19.21 uh, is when we see him. We also see him in Acts 19.20. Uh, um, he's the fellow worker of Paul. Um, other things to mention, uh, the Day of Atonement, that's also Yom Kippur, so we know it's heading towards fall. Now, an interesting thing, thing is that, that happens in verse 11. Paul says, Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to the ship and cargo and to our own lives. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship. Paul is a prisoner, okay? Keep that in mind. He is, from the captain's perspective of the ship and the Roman centurion's perspective and the owner of the ship, Paul is some Jewish scholar guy, former member of the Sanhedrin, who is a prisoner of Rome who's going to appear in Caesar's court. So what is this guy, this prisoner, giving them advice for, and why should we possibly listen to him? It makes sense that they don't listen to him. It makes sense that, they, that, that he listens to the pilot and the owner of the ship. These are guys that are um, maritime specialists. These guys live on the sea. What does Paul know of this? Well, let's actually um, flip over to 2 Corinthians 11.25 which as I've mentioned before, 2 Corinthians was a letter that he wrote uh, on his third missionary journey. Oh, excuse me. It might have actually been, I need to look. Let's see. When did he write Corinthians? Corinthians, it's on his third missionary journey. Excuse me. Um, from Ephesus was the first one. Macedonia in 55 is when he wrote 2 Corinthians. We are now between 57 and 50, excuse me, we're in 59. 59 AD or CE, whatever. So this is... Uh, three years to four years since he wrote uh, 2 Corinthians. So let's pick it up. What were we reading? 2 Corinthians. Oh, good grief. And I didn't even mark my spot. Dave, you are a wreck this morning. Give me a second. I need to find where I was in Acts. Acts 27, 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11. Okay, and we're actually going to pick it up on verse... 
21. 2 Corinthians 11, 21. So this is a letter that Paul writes to the Corinthian church, obviously. Um, and this is the second of these letters that he's writing. Well, one of the things that's happening right now is that the Corinthians have embraced these super apostles. Uh, these guys that come in and tote themselves as being all that as apostles. And Unfortunately, Paul has to prove himself, and he overly, he says, why am I doing this? I, I am boasting, and I'm going to boast like a fool, and those are his words he's going to say, but pick it up with me. Uh, 2 Corinthians eleven twenty one. Whatever anyone else dares to boast about, I am speaking as a fool, I also dare to boast about. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I'm out of my mind for talking like this. This is kind of fun because now we are getting actual Paul's voice. Acts was written by Luke, not Paul. So you can feel this difference. It's, it's much more personal. He's actually speaking to the reader and he actually has his own inner commentary. I'm out of my mind for talking like this. I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. So this is why I reference this. This was written at least three years, if not four years, before our point in Acts 27. So Paul does know what he's talking about. He's been shipwrecked three times. So understandably, the guy's a little apprehensive of being shipwrecked yet again. He can see that the, the storm is brewing. He's been shipwrecked three times, and he spent an entire day and night in the open sea. So the guy does know what he's talking about. But again, you can understand why the pilot, uh, the captain, doesn't listen to, the centurion doesn't listen to Paul, but inside, instead decides to lead to listen to the owner of the ship. He's the one that has the biggest uh, loss if the ship gets shipwrecked. So it's an interesting element. Now, also, this is Paul speaking uh, from his experience, but this is not uh, a divine uh, word of the Lord that was given to him and he's prophesying here. How do we know this? Because he says that uh, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to the ship, cargo, and to our lives also. He's just simply saying that, men, we need to stay here because I fear we're, we're going to die. He's, uh, I just need to preface that to say that this was not the angel speaking to him. And we know this because no one's lives were lost. Okay, continuing on. So the storm hits and they cannot go to the uh, far western side of Crete like they had planned on to winter because the winds hit them and they cannot, they can't go that way. They simply are at the mercy of the winds now. Thankfully, they're blowing west. But as was mentioned, um, verse 20, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days um, and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. If you can't see the sun, and you can't see the stars, and I don't have my phone sitting here, and you don't have GPS, how do you know where you are? They use the sun during the day, and they use the stars at night to be able to navigate. Well, they can't steer anything. They can't know where they're going, which is why they were so um, afraid and why they gave up all hope because they're literally just being tossed by the storm, not knowing if they're going to hit Northern Africa or be tossed all the way back to Greece. They have no idea where they're going or what's going to happen to them. But we do see Paul comfort them twice. Twice we see this. Uh, on verse 24, uh, actually let's back up just a little bit. Verse 22, but now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost, only the ship will be destroyed. Last night an angel of God, the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, do not be afraid, Paul, you must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. So this is backing up. 
Paul has now been told multiple times by the Holy Spirit, you're going to go to Rome. So Paul is confident that he will end up in Rome because the angel now has told him that God has given you the lives of all the sailors that are with you. Paul now is experienced. He is tight with God. He knows God's going to hold through to that promise. So he gives courage and, and, and strength to the fellow sailors. And then again, he says uh, on verse 33, just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from your head. After he said this, he took some bread, gave thanks to God in front of them all. Then he broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. So I want us to flip over, and this time I'm going to put my marker in place so I don't lose my spot. We're going to go back to 2 Corinthians, but we're going to do 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4. Not Romans. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4. This is uh, his introduction at the very beginning of 2 Corinthians. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. Let me read that again. Praise be to the God of the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. Paul is able to comfort these guys in the midst of the tempest, in the midst, midst of this raging storm. He is able to comfort them. Why? Because exactly what he says here at the beginning of Corinthians we are able to comfort those around us because of the comfort we received first from the Lord. When you have a solid belief in God that is rock foundation in your life, the things that might have really caused you to freak out and lose uh, composure no longer have sway on your life. I know for me personally, as a wedding photographer, man, weddings can be a stressful thing. But when you keep in mind the history and the experience that I have when I go in to shoot a wedding, and also the comfort that I have in God and knowing that this is just one day. This is just one moment in this couple's life. When something crazy happens, I'm cool and calm simply because I have that perspective of saying, you know what? That has just happened. But what's the worst case scenario right now? Let's take some perspective. And I am able to comfort the bride, the groom, the mother of the bride, uh, because of that comfort I've received from God. It's all about perspective. If you know that you are God's, what can harm you? If you know you belong to God, is what I'm saying, what's the worst thing that can happen to you? And that's what we see Paul do here. So that's one, and now stepping out and saying, okay, what are our takeaways from studying Acts 27? That's one of them right there. In the midst of the storm, take courage and be comfort to those around you because God comforts you and gives you strength. That gives you strength to then comfort others. Okay, continuing on. Uh, that is 2 Corinthians Okay, so now um, the guys eventually doop, 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 land in Malta. And that's where we pick up the story right now is they land in Malta. And this is kind of funny is, is that I looked up on Google, uh, yet again, uh, modern day Malta. And it's amazing how much stuff is named after St. Paul. You find what's called St. Paul's Bay, which here is a modern day um, uh, map view of, Saint, uh, of Malta. Uh, let's zoom in. This is St. Paul's Bay, and you see St. Paul's Shoal. Uh, uh, there's St. Paul's Island. There's Shipwreck Window. 
um, statue of St. Paul. Uh, the road, actually, that you see going along the bottom there is uh, uh, St. Paul's Way. I mean, everything is named after St. Paul. Uh, understandably so, I imagine on one level, uh, tourism uh, is a big thing, uh, and everyone's trying to, to make a buck off of that, but there's, you know, historically speaking, this is where uh, Paul and the crew got shipwrecked. I also found it funny. Um, this photo is a modern day satellite picture of St. Paul's Bay. And the thing that blew me away, look at all those boats. Here's a zoomed in photo of it. That, I mean, it's just amazing to me. There's no marina, there's no like docks. They're literally just thousand boats that are in this harbor all very, 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 very close together. I, I mean, I don't, whatever, I'm, I'm not a sailor, but that just looks like uh, navigating through that if you wanted to leave looks a bit crazy to me. That's a modern day look of the bay that uh, historians believe um, is the bay in Malta where they landed. Okay, so now let's pick it up on uh, the start of um, chapter 28. When safely on shore, we found out that the island was called Malta. The islanders showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed us all because, um, all because it was raining and cold. Paul gathered a pile of brushwood, and as he put it on the fire, a viper, driven out by the heat, fastened itself on his hand. When the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, This man must be a murderer, for though he escaped from the sea, the goddess Justice has not allowed him to live. But Paul shook the snake off uh, into the fire and suffered no ill effect. The people expected him to swell up or suddenly fall dead. But after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and said he was a god. <laughs> Uh, there was an estate nearby that belonged to uh, Publius, the chief official on the island. He welcomed us to his home and showed us generous hospitality for three days. His father was sick in bed and suffering from fever and dysentery. Paul went in to see him and after prayer, placed his hands on him and healed him. When this had happened, the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. They honored us in many ways and when we were ready to sail, they furnished us with supplies we needed. After three months, we put out to sea in a ship that, was, that had wintered in the island. It was an Alexandrian ship with the figurehead of the twin gods Castor and Pollux. We put into Syracuse and stayed there three days. From there, we set sail and arrived at Regium. The next day, the south wind came up, and on the following day, we reached Petoli. There we found some brothers and sisters who invited us to spend a week with them, and so we came to Rome. The brothers and sisters there had heard that we were coming, and they traveled as far as the Forum of Appius uh, and the three taverns to meet us. At the sight of these people, Paul thanked God and was encouraged. When we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. And thus, Paul is now in Rome, finally. So um, let's talk about this just a little bit. Um, a few things that I want to note. Verse 3 of chapter 28, Paul gathered a pile of brushwood and put it on the fire. It's a small little line that he went and gathered firewood. He could have just laid there. He could have simply just sat down by the fire and made somebody else do it. But I think it's pretty cool to see that, that the apostle Paul was humble. Uh, that he was not above going and gathering sticks. And where did he get that from? Uh, well, let's flip over to John uh, chapter 13, verse 4. Flip over to John. I'm going to put my marker in place. In verse 4. Okay, verse 4. Uh, John 13, 4. Um, so he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. This is uh, Jesus did these things. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, you're going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you, don't, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord said Simon Peter, 
replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. The idea here is that Jesus is giving uh, Peter and us today an example that Christ followers are not above any job. No matter how low it is, we are called to be servants. The greatest must be the least. That's why Jesus, who is Lord, who is God incarnate, stoops to, to, to drop down to his hands and knees and do the dirtiest thing of washing these guys' feet. Keep in mind, they're wearing sandals walking through arid desert. Their feet are no doubt disgusting. And Jesus drops down to do this. That's where Peter's like, no, what are you doing? You're God incarnate. You're the Lord. You don't wash my feet. And Jesus' response is, if you don't let me wash my feet, you can't have any part of me. And I love, this is classic Peter. So he's like, then wash my head and my hands as well. Wash me all over. Give me a bath. And it's Peter. So I love the fact that we see Paul doing just that. It's just a small little excerpt, but I think it's pretty cool that he, Luke makes sure to say that, that this is the great apostle Paul, the learned teacher, the writer, the historian, um, that doesn't mind taking the time to uh, go and get firewood. Okay. Um, now, this element of Paul being bit by the snake. So Malta today does have vipers, does have snakes, uh, specifically vipers that are not poisonous. They do not have poisonous vipers today. But clearly, the natives were expecting it to be poisonous. So there's one of two things. One, um, very likely... Uh, the people, the farmers living in Malta uh, in the time between then and now, some 2,000 years, killed off all the poisonous snakes. Malta is tiny, a tiny little island. And it's understandable that they would have been easily be able to do that. We know based on how the locals respond that there were poisonous snakes that existed then. So one of two things happens here. Either it's a non-poisonous snake that bites Paul and it's not a big deal, or it is a poisonous snake, and Paul is miraculously healed. I don't know which it is, and I don't think it really makes that big of a difference. It's not that crazy to think one way or the other. It doesn't make this big deal out of uh, the fact that he suddenly healed himself, so it very well could be that it was just a non-venomous snake, and it really doesn't change the story all that much at all, but what it does show us is the fickleness of the crowd, the fickleness of the mob, that and their beliefs, their superstitions. If something bad happens to you, you obviously deserved it. The gods are punishing you because this happened. And then when he shakes it off as if nothing's a problem, then they think, ooh, he's a god. We need to worship him. Now let's talk about as far as takeaway as far as us today. In looking at this, the, the superstitions uh, that people have in assuming if something bad happens to you, you deserve it. The rain falls on the just and the wicked the same. People get cancer who are saints and who are sinners, horrible people. Uh, good things happen to good people. Amazingly awesome blessings happen to horrible, horrible, horrible people. And that's biblical. We know that the rain falls on both the just and the, and, and the unjust. God talks about that. Here is a question. Why didn't God save Paul? Why didn't God calm the storm? Why didn't Paul pray to God to calm the storm? Could he have done that? Well, yeah, absolutely he could. We actually saw that. Uh, in Luke 8. Why don't you flip over to Luke chapter 8. Lean back this way. What happens in Luke 8? I'm sure a lot of you people are, get, a lot of people are guessing this right now. Luke 8 verse 22. One day Jesus said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side of the lake. 
So they got into a boat and set out. As they sailed, he fell asleep. A squall came down in the lake so that the boat was being swamped and they were in great danger. The disciples went and woke him saying, Master, Master, we're going to die. He got up and rebuked the wind and raging waters. The storm subsided and all was calm. Where is your faith? He asked his disciples. In fear and amazement, they asked one another, who is this? He commands even the winds and the water and they obey him. So, did God have the power to be able to quell the storm? Yeah, absolutely he did. But clearly he wanted them to go through it. So, here's the takeaway when we look at this story of modern day application. How can we apply this story to our lives? There will be storms in our life. There's no question of that. You are going to go through amazing hardships. But is it God's blessing to remove that from you? Think about that for a second. How do you get stronger through trial? From a physical standpoint, the way that you get stronger muscles is by lifting weights. You, you intentionally put your muscle through hardship, through resistance, and as a result of that, your muscle grows because it's used to that hardship. In the same way, if you want to grow as a believer, you have to go through trials. You have to go through turmoil. So when we hit hardship and we pray, Lord, take this hardship from us, you might very well be saying, I don't want to grow stronger. This is too hard for me. I don't want to endure this. But what God is specifically doing in your life is putting you through a challenge so that you will grow stronger. One of my favorite verses is 1 Corinthians 9.24. And I love this as an athlete, an amateur athlete, but still an athlete. I love training, doing Ironmans. I love what we are able to do to our bodies. And that's why uh, 1 Corinthians 9.24 is one of my favorite verses. Do you not know that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person wins the prize? Therefore, run to win the prize. In the games, all the athletes go into strict training, but they train for a crown that will not last. We train for a crown that will last for eternity. Therefore, I do not run aimlessly, nor do I beat the air like a boxer, but I beat my body into submission, making it my slave, so that after I have preached, I too will be in the running for the prize. I love that verse. Now, on the surface level, you look at that and that means, okay, you should train. You should train your body to always get first place whenever you go and run a race. Yeah, you could take it to mean that, but the idea is, is that you need to run with fervor and with perseverance with the goal in mind of heaven, of winning that race. Hebrews 12.1 is also one of my other favorite verses that I've quoted before. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us run the race marked out for us with perseverance. We have challenges that are put into our lives by God. Now, one of the questions is, is that the challenges that are put there, did, does God specifically cause bad things to happen to us so we can grow? I don't know the answer to that. There are certain things that I know I've had things that have been put in my life to challenge me, but if I was to go through and, and look and, and say, well, why do good people get cancer? You know, that's one of those things that I'm not God and I don't know the answer to that. And that's a tough one. That is a tough one to be able to look at. Let me pull up my notes here just to make sure that I don't ramble on for on and on. Um, uh, this is a good verse. Romans 8, 21. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So, a person getting cancer. Is that God showing them that they love him? That's a tough one. That is a really tough one. And that goes back to 
in this life, you are going to go through trials. You are going to go through tribulation. You are gonna have bad things happen to you. But the perspective is, is that you can cry about it and you can complain about it, or you can grow through it. And that's the takeaway for today is is that you might in your life right now be going through uh, a hurricane. But realize that God is with you and take courage from that and encourage those who are going through the storm with you to keep in mind the perspective of heaven. And that worst case scenario, what? You're going to die? But think about that for a second. Worst case scenario for a Christian is the best day of your life. The very best day of my life is going to be when I die because then all of the issues we deal with here on earth are done. Sinful nature, all of that gone, and I am in heaven. The best day of my life is yet to come when I finally get to be in God's presence. With that in mind, We should be so full of joy and be able to handle any storm that comes to us. Just keep that in mind. I know it's tough to do, especially when you're right in the midst of it, but keep it in mind and be encouragement for others. Next week, we are wrapping up the book of Acts. We are finishing Acts 28, and we're going to take a look back on Paul's journey and the book of Acts, and we're going to look forward into the future at Romans and that study that we're going to be doing. So why don't you bow your heads and uh, let's give this time back to God. Lord, thank you. Thank you for this time. Oh, Lord, I pray that you would give all of us courage and strength when we're going through that storm to have the perspective to know that you are with us, standing next to us or carrying us through the trial, through the storm, and that through that we can take courage and that we can be comforted And that from that comfort, we can then be a comfort to those around us. Thank you, Lord, for the storm that that you brought on that that caused all this to happen and that Paul was able to um, go on to Rome and that Luke was able to be part of this and to, to write about it. We love you, Lord. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So have a phenomenal week, and I'll see you guys next week, and we will wrap up the book of Acts.